So let me start it off by giving everyone just a brief introduction to our topic before we actually go in deeper on talking about how cash is so important to us. And uh, of course, a little bit of disclaimer and let's move on to the topic of the day, the VIP of the day. Um, today we're going to talk about the one thing that everybody loves and not only we love it, we also need it and it can't be denied. Uh, it's just a piece of paper, but this piece of paper actually will bring us a lot of uh, a lot of needs that we want, a lot of happiness that we want, uh, not just by just buying food. Sometimes we also need cash to, you know, get the uh, luxury things that we want, go for a vacation. So in essence, cash has been the most basic um, item, the primitive uh, basic item that we need in our lives to further uh, buy uh, other stuff that we need, whether it's, it's, is it stuff that we require or is it stuff that uh, we really want uh, just for pleasure purposes. Um, before going into the current situation where we at that, um, let's go back in time um, during the old ages where there was no money. So at that time, how did people actually transact? So that was a time where people did goods exchange, which is called the barter system. You had fish, I had chicken, and uh, you wanted what I have, I wanted what you had. So we just made a very quick, easy trade. But down the road, we know that some items are not proportionate. What if, if I have a cow and you only have fish? It is impossible for me to give you my whole cow just in exchange for one fish, right? So uh, we evolved. We tried to uh, use seashells or stones as a means of uh, transacting value between uh, each item. We ascribe a certain value. Uh, let's say, for example, a whole cow costs 10 shells and one fish costs one shell. So you can easily um, use seashells as a mode of transaction. But then again, uh, somewhere down the road, again, we found that seashells or stones are not that viable because uh, they are everywhere. Uh, if seashells were the means of uh, proving someone is is rich, then uh, I think the fishermen will not be catching fish. They'll be collecting seashells all day. So ultimately, we ended up with the first uh, universal system of uh, transacting goods with uh, real coins. Coins mean made of gold and uh, it's uniform. You can't reproduce it. You can't pick it up anywhere. So it's the first so-called universal system uh, of transacting between each other. But as you all know, uh, it started off with gold coins. After that, it went on to gold bars, gold bullions, and gold is actually very heavy. So what to do? You can't be carrying uh, 50 gold bars around and doing your shopping right back then. So what they did was uh, they put every, every gold that they have inside the bank, and the bank would actually issue a piece of paper, a piece of note, and the, the note itself will denote how much gold you have in the bank. So let's say if I have 50 gold bars in the bank, and I'll have 50 notes. If I go shopping, uh, uh, buying stuff, then I will just pay equivalently the, the notes itself. So somewhere down the road, uh, these notes become to be more uniform. Uh, they had some basic requirements to uh, prevent forgery, and uh, each country eventually issued out their respective own notes. And this is the so-called... Uh, paper currency that we are currently using today. So back to the OHO question. So is cash really that important? So is it really king? And should we hold on to every piece of cash that we really have on our hands? One thing that we really need to understand, or it's the uh, reality currently, is that the cash that we have be it the US dollar, the Great Britain pound, the Singapore dollar, or even the Malaysian ringgit that we are so accustomed to. These currencies are actually fiat currencies. So you might wonder, what is fiat currencies and what is it so different from, um, from other modes of transaction, uh, like gold bars or seashells? What is, what is actually fiat currencies? So in a very basic uh, explanation, the fiat currency is a piece of paper, normal piece of paper, that the government actually gives approval to describe a certain face value. Let's say if it's just a normal piece of paper and then the government say, okay, print this paper into 10 ringgit and then you have your 10 ringgit. 
uh, it's con controlled by the government, it's controlled by the bank negara. And uh, of course, from there on, you have uh, your two ringgit bills, your five ringgit bills, your 10 ringgit bills, and your 15 ringgit bills. And the very ultimate uh, characteristic of a fiat currency is it does not hold any intrinsic value. Meaning to say that one day, uh, if a government ultimately fails, uh, the current country's currency will not be valuable anymore. So for very brief examples, you, previously we have countries like uh, Argentina where their peso uh, really became worthless because uh, the government uh, had some problems back then with their economic situation. So in just one day, the whole uh, Argentinian peso where the, where the Argentinians were using just literally became worthless and uh, without value. So uh, it could happen to any currencies if the government does not govern the country uh, properly. So under normal circumstances, of course, uh, each and every day, uh, all major currencies uh, have their value ascribed by the government and because we have the faith in the government that is currently governing the country. So, uh, okay, I think, under the normal circumstances, yes, uh, you have your ringgit uh, as solid as ever. Well, but uh, during times where situations are abnormal, like currently where we are undergoing MCO or circuit, circuit breaker, uh, where economic uh, climate situation is not normal, people are not working as the normal because everyone is uh, under lockdown. So under such circumstances, what would actually happen uh, to a country's currency or country's economic situation? Maybe I would pass back to Chun Beng this round to let him explain on what happens during uh, the normal situation and the uh, abnormal economic situations as well. Yep, I think it's my time to take over. Uh, the sharing here uh, that I'm going to do is basically using off a very simple uh, chart or you can call it uh, a uh, a thing that I display in the slide right now is the supply demand curve that I try to illustrate in a very simple manner to tell you a hard truth that is happening now. So before I go into the illustration, maybe I will take a step back, uh, let you understand uh, what does this graph represent. Basically, if you are familiar with uh, supply demand curve, maybe you can take a pause, you can go to the toilet because uh, I'm going to explain this thing uh, here. Uh, you can see in this graph, um, the x axis itself is actually the price. So the price means uh, the higher it goes is the more expensive it is. While the one in, in, in the x axis, okay, sorry, the one that I mentioned just now is the y axis. The one in x axis is actually the quantity. The more on the right uh, is the higher the quantity it is. And then you can see the one in the red line, it represents supply, it's a supply curve. So it's quite normal that you see uh, when the price go higher, naturally people will go and produce more product of it because they, they will think they can make more from this price point. Where, while this product is actually cheap, they have no motivation to do it at all. And then on the other hand, the demand curve uh, react in an invert, uh, inverted way. Uh, it's, it's quite normal with our human behavior. The cheaper the thing it is, the more you wanted to buy. And then now come back to the key thing. What is happening now? I, I, I won't go into very details. We all know what is going on. Pandemic has been happening. Uh, lockdown, economy slow down. People need to take on uh, uh, a lot of stimulus packages from the government. So this is one example of, of, of immediate thing that happened uh, during an economic crisis for period like this. You can see the demand curve will go down because uh, people locked down at homes, they cannot uh, have, they have fears, they, they have, don't have confidence to spend. So they tend to keep the money and then the demand go down. By right, during this time, actually supply should correct themselves because when the demand go down, uh, supply usually won't stay the same because when they stay the same means they need to sell the thing at a cheaper price. What is happening right now make it worse. Why am, am I saying this is because now due to lockdown or the nature of people need to have social distancing, we are at the scenario where the supply curve, no matter what you do, no matter what demand curve, uh, demand is changing, it, 
it will be sort of a static uh, point. Why am, am I saying that? It because regardless of uh, how much you wanted to pay for it, what is the demand like? They cannot, they, they cannot do it. Let's say you got hunger industry in Malaysia, 80% of it is shut down. No matter how much money you pay them, they cannot operate at all. So this is actually causing an immediate effect of dropping of price. And this is a sign of a recession. But what actually make you worse, you'll be surprised. Something that we found out or something that we learned from the past is when all these things happen, uh, all the governments, all the people will try to do something to help to boost the economy and so on. So what you can see, the world has been trying to do this. Uh, US and coming coming out with unlimited QE. Malaysia have the pre heartening stimulus. And this helped to push up the demand. But will this change the supply? Sadly, it's a no, because the lockdown will continue even though it resumed, but then uh, a lot of people still have fear to, to, to work on it. Uh, the demand may not pick up that, that fast. The, regardless of how you do it, the supply curve remains the same. And what will be the impact of this? A very scary thing is coming in the next two to five years. Hyperinflation is coming. Are we or are you ready for it? So let me go back to the slide again. If you take a look on this, you, you, in the near future, you might see the supply curve can be back to normal, but then it will take time to do it. And before this happened, the government has been throwing tons of money. If you take US as an example, unlimited QE is, is ridiculous, meaning they just turn on the, the water pipe, keep on printing up money to fill the gap. Are they really filling up the correct gap? We don't know. But if this is happened and we are seeing this coming, what should we do? So when, when me and Jupan found out this thing, uh, uh, we also have a lot of chit chat, have a lot of discussion. Then we have decided to look into the past. When all these things happen, typically what it will reflect, let's say the first thing, the ringgit uh, 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 historical inflation rates. What happened to them uh, after all these things? So this is the chart that's showing the inflation rate uh, in the past 20 years. The normal thing that happened uh, after some crisis, be it 1998 uh, crisis or, or 2008 subprime mortgage uh, crisis, the next year typically the, the inflation rate will shoot up. But the fact is, if you look in this uh, in details, you will find out there isn't any negative happening. Inflation has been always going on, on a steady manner, even though it, it might be up and down, but average, averagely, it will be hitting about 2.5. Let's say we take 20 years historical inflation rate as an example. What does this mean? It, it means that if you are doing nothing, the money that you keep in the bank are depreciating in 2.5% on a, every single year. Then we try to see if you wanted to do something, what is the best thing to do? Again, we go into another chart. So this is the KLSE 10 year historical return uh, chart. Then uh, we try to compare it after 2008 uh, subprime uh, mortgage crisis. What happens? You can see the, the last 10 year, even though the, the reason uh, breakdown or because of all this pandemic, the, the stock market crash, you are still seeing at a, about 11.16% returns, which is much higher than what uh, you can see in the inflation, meaning this is one of the good tools or a good place for you to look into if you wanted to outbid the inflation. Besides uh, the stock market, then the next thing that we look into is housing. Or well, you'll be surprised how much Malaysia uh, property price has flipped over the last 10 years. But then, uh, of course, this comes with a lot of other factors. Uh, city is getting crowded, uh, land is getting scarce. Uh, a lot of factors are coming in, but then it's still a good place to look into uh, during uh, issues like this. It tends to have a lot of growth potential. You see, even developed countries like Japan, Singapore, they are still 
seeing a, a good raise of it. But then the, the different thing is uh, compared to stock, this is relatively uh, non-liquid uh, and it requires a big sum of amount to, to support it. Lastly, it's one interesting thing that, that we also uh, uh, look into it in details is the gold price. A lot of people say when things happen, forget about everything, stocks, forget about it, it, it will collapse, let's hold the gold. But is this really the right thing? It depends. Uh, if you see the 30 years, which is on the top, you can see historically, yes, uh, his gold price has been continuously uh, going up. But it usually will go up after economic crisis. But whether it will continue to go up and give you dividend return or those things, the answer is maybe a no. So if you can see the graph over here, during the last 10 year uh, uh, graph of the, the return of gold price uh, is actually fluctuating. But then if you ask me right now, is it a good time to look into gold? The answer maybe is a yes, but then def definitely you need to have your exit strategy, know when is the time for you to let go because eventually uh, this, is, this isn't like stock, like, like some dividend stock, you, you won't get anything. The only thing you will get is the absolute uh, capital gain. So this is something we want you guys to have a thought with, with it during all these things happen. Is cash really the king? And this is some of the code that we wanted to share with you. Yes, cash, maybe it's just a pre prince to us. Cash flow is the true king. Hopefully, uh, we have shared something that interesting to you. Uh, I will hand over back to, to, to Japan to, to share some of his thoughts while I try to get some questions from you guys. Guys, please comment something uh, in, in the Facebook, then we will take on the question right now. Okay, okay, okay. Sure, maybe uh, I would just further clarify the last quote that we shared to our audience on why we think cash is prince and cash flow is king. Because ultimately, uh, as just now as we shared, if you just keep cash in your bank, you do nothing with it. Uh, of course, every every year you will still get your so-called basic uh, interest from the bank, but the interest from the banks will not be enough to hedge off the inflation uh, or the or the so-called devaluation uh, of your currency. It means every month, every year you put your money in a bank, you do nothing about it. Uh, Inflation happens and you lose 2.5% and on average on, uh, every year. So even if you have 1 million ringgit sitting in a bank and you do nothing with the, the, bank, the money, uh, eventually every year when inflation kicks in, uh, you see the value growing small and small. And this is and a very good example to show you is maybe, uh, maybe if you remember for, for us, Chimbing, uh, around 30 years old, uh, probably when we were in uni days, uh, one piece of roti chanai maybe costs just one ringgit. I think currently the inflation has made a piece of roti chanai cost maybe 120 or even 150. Yeah. So um, why cash is just prints that yes, it can help us to buy what we want, but uh, letting your cash sit idly inside the bank without doing anything to protect it will, it's just as good as just having uh, something to to in your bank ready to buy something but uh, if you keep keep it long enough also it won't generate the return or to preserve the value uh, for you to buy what you want in the coming days whereas cash flow is something where you invest into a certain let's say for property you buy a property and then you collect rent from the property and of course when uh, property prices are going up and uh, your your rents uh, your your rent per month also will go up because uh, people are willing or more affordable uh, can can be able to pay higher rents and this is how along the years uh, how property investors actually uh, get their higher rental for stocks investors they find a very good company uh, which is paying out good dividends and along the years if the company continues to grow business becomes bigger and company earns more cash and they will eventually pay out more dividends to the investors. So ultimately, this is how um, how uh, investing or certain investment vehicles like property investment or, or stocks 
investing actually provides uh, the power of cash flow to uh, any investors who are willing to take advantage or spend time to look into it before making the decision. So this is uh, very important to really continue remembering that cash flow will always be more superior than having uh, solid liquid cash in just inside the bank. Yeah, we have our okay. first question, Jufan, please take a look. Okay. So we haven't, so CT said that uh, we haven't even start the depression yet. Oh my God. So what portion or ratio do you recommend to save in cash, maintain, invest in low and high risk investments for the time being and when the depression starts? Um, CT, this is a very good question. I think uh, if you look back roughly two weeks uh, ago, uh, that was where the stock market was actually going down and down and down. But uh, I think after the past two weeks, uh, stock markets did came up again a bit. Uh, but some people are saying that the worst is over because we are up by 20% from the bottom. Technically, we are in the uh, bull run. But uh, we have to ask ourselves these basic questions. Is COVID-19 over or not? If not, can we somehow... Uh, stay or live in harmony together with COVID-19. Like for example, we are currently accepting the fact that we aren't able to treat AIDS. AIDS is still uh, very much affecting us, but AIDS is not that contagious. People are still dying every day because of AIDS, but it's not that contagious and we have learned to live on with AIDS. But COVID-19 is a different story. It is so contagious and uh, more and more people are getting infected every day. And you have to ask yourself, whether we can one day suddenly happy say that, okay, uh, we can't solve COVID-19. Uh, we just cancel MCO, cancel circuit breaker. Everyone goes back to work as per normal. If that can happen, then maybe it's the, the then it becomes logical for economic uh, activity to cut to resume and uh, stock markets to continue go higher and higher. If not, then you have to step back and think that if this is not the so-called current way forward, that means that we have to beat COVID-19. After we beat COVID-19, uh, we have a lot of effort to pick up because uh, people uh, are unemployed, people have so much uh, economic hardship during this COVID-19. And uh, definitely that would translate into some effects to the stock market. So that's one part of the question. Uh, of course, we really haven't really reached the depression yet. What portion of ratio do you recommend to save in cash? I would say that it depends on personal uh, preferences. Uh, if you are thinking that current market conditions are low enough to invest more, by all means, you can really invest more. But if you are same thought like me, knowing that, uh, of course, COVID-19 is isn't really uh, properly solved yet, and uh, there's more uh, scary situations awaiting us, then perhaps you should uh, wait and see, like I'm currently doing. Uh, but of course, there are also opportunities there where you can start to nibble a bit, um, maintain, invest in low and high risk investment. This is also a very personal uh, preference. Some people like to go for high growth, high returns company, while some people love to invest in stable dividend stocks. So it's really up to your personal choice. If you are someone who likes dividend stocks, you should look at them. If you are someone who fancy high growth, high volatility, you can also look at them, but do your due diligence before you buy anything. So uh, yeah, I think that basically covers my questions, uh, my answers for City. So do we have other questions coming in? Yeah, I was still waiting, but never mind. I personally want to, to share something. Uh... Because we, we, we have did a live session with, with some other guy, uh, I think last last Saturday, uh, where we trying to, to find out, uh, because a lot of people say, yeah, it's, it's pandemic, uh, there are a lot of loser, but is there any winner during this, uh, this kind of crisis? Yes, uh, I would say if you, uh, uh, people that well versed with, with all this information has been reading news. Uh, we will offer two. We, I will take two example uh, of, of stock that technically benefit. Uh, they are benefiting from from this uh, period or from this uh, lockdown or whatnot. One of it is is 
one of the stock that that is uh, related to this is Netflix. A lot of people say, yeah, now lockdown, people stay at home, uh, all these viewership should go up, people start to watch TV, even Astro seems to be promising. Yes, uh, if you guys are, are taking a look in, in all these kind of immediate uh, re return, you always need to be mindful that uh, you need to ask yourself, all these things that look good during this lockdown period or during all this pandemic, it, it, is this a short-term boost or a long-term gain? If you take Netflix as an example, streaming, yes, short-term wise, definitely is good. People will start to subscribe. But if everything go back to normal, it really depends. Uh, it might continue to go up a little bit, but then whether will be that good uh, uh, during lockdown period like this, uh, I would say it's a no. And then, then you ask me, what is the thing that might have a long-term impact? For me, the one that will have a long-term impact is something that helps uh, the company, the, the, the society to be able to do everything from home. Like it or not, work from home is the new normal. Because when these two to six week kind of lockdown, he has trained up all the people, the skill they need to, to do it from home. When they start to do it from home, people start to question, do I really need to start in jam, go to offices for a business meeting? Do, do I need to uh, uh, take LRT all the way from, from uh, Subang, go, go, to, go to KL just, just to uh, clock in to, to my office and, and then uh, meet with my colleague? Is this really a need? For me, a lot of companies definitely will have a plan on this after a uh, uh, pandemic gone. This definitely will be a new norm. And what will actually benefit from all this is the tools that help people achieve it. A Zoom can be one of the good examples, but whether Zoom is the best thing to go after or not uh, is a question mark. Of course, now they have some security issue. I won't talk about it. But then if you go, you are up to all these things, uh, you think Zoom is, is good, uh, you also need to be mindful that uh, Zoom, is, nevertheless, they are just a video conferencing tools. Uh, they are not as strong as tools that are offered by Microsoft. Microsoft also has something like called Microsoft Team. They can do the same thing and they can offer more. Google also can do the same thing. So all these things that uh, you should always take note First is analyze who will be the winner and then whether it's a short-term or long-term gain. Secondly, if this thing is a long-term game and then it suits your profile, then you should see who is the potential competitor and whether this will be the one that will win the race at the end. I think there are a few questions coming in. Jupa, maybe you want to take one of it? Okay, let's see who... Let's see the next question. Uh... Okay, uh, Nicholas. Oh, wait. Before Nicholas, we have Yi Jing. How to plan for the entry and exit strategy? Uh, okay. Basically, the entry price uh, for, for me personally, I will always uh, have a strategy uh, when setting my entry price. So in the very, because this is a very uh, complicated topic, I will try to make it simple. Uh, basically, for in a very uh, basic times, uh, when you plan your entry is, for example, um, this stock has always been trading at 20 times PE. And due to the current market scenario, the current pandemic, uh, share, share markets have tumbled. Uh, and the current price is giving you a uh, 18, 18 or 15 times PE. And this company is a solid company, has a huge growth potential, nothing wrong with their balance sheet, uh, no debts or very little debts, won't go bust during the uh, crisis. And uh, of course, if that's the case, uh, it becomes a very uh, lucrative time to actually pick up the stock because it's a good company. Uh, it doesn't have any money issues. It's uh, trading at a fair PE or below, slightly below P, uh, the market fair PE because of the current situation, uh, I would buy a bit of it. And of course, under some circumstances, or most circumstances, every time we buy a stock, 
prices will go down again. And that is where I will strategize my purchase strategy. Uh, I will not buy everything at one shot. I will split it maybe to three tranches. The first tranche, I buy it at that price. If it goes down small, I think it's still reasonable. Nothing wrong with the company. Company's uh, direction or health never changed. I would then uh, deploy my second uh, tranche. And it, it really goes down again. Uh, this time even lower, but still nothing changes on the uh, basic fundamentals of the company. That would be the final time I would unload my uh, budget final tranche to buy this company. Then you might ask me, what if it goes down more and more? The answer is I will stay invested with that amount because that was my game plan. Uh, my game plan was to commit this amount of money for this company. I split it up to three purchase tranches. And even after I buy three times, it goes down small, then so be it. Because this is one of the uh, so-called methodologies or strategies to hedge your risk. Eventually, if the companies, if there's anything wrong with your analysis, then you would be thankful that you just invested this amount instead of keep buying more and more uh, in, in the event your strategy or your analysis had some post and you made a mistake. So this is how you control your downside. And you also take advantage of the dropping price in the event of uh, uh, if the company is a good company and uh, you try to buy more of it. And when you exit, so typically, if I were to exit a company, uh, basically would be a good example would be suddenly a competitor come out. This company has been very strong. But suddenly a competitor come out. Uh, they were cheaper than this, this company that I invested in. They... Uh, earn more money, earn more profit in terms of balance sheet, everything, they somehow are better. Then, uh, of course, it impacts the sales, the revenue, everything, the performances of the company I am invested in. So I would be wise enough to actually exit because a competitor has uh, arrived, appeared, and it has impacted the company that I have invested in, uh, knowing that the fact that they will be faced with a tough situation and would not be able to sustain their growth. So it doesn't have to be uh, another competitor. Sometimes it's just a change of trend. So back then, 20 years ago, uh, in the Malaysian market, we have Star Media, uh, a listed company that uh, prints newspaper, but their main revenue is actually from uh, making printed uh, advertisements in their newspaper. So they are very good. Uh, everyone bought newspapers, and that was the way to actually make advertisements. But somewhere down the road, um, people become more digitalized. Uh, Facebook is the new advertisement platform, YouTube as well. And people started to consume less newspaper as well. So back then, if you were a Star Media's uh, uh, investor, uh, when you start to see that Facebook is coming out and people are buying less and less newspapers, that should have been your cue or your hint to actually exit or to take profit of any investments that you had with Star Media. So back then, uh, Back to the real uh, answer is really to notice that how uh, your company is affected by the current situations. Next, we have, uh, let's see, let's see. Okay, when I typical, Nicholas is saying, when do I typically exit an investment and take profit? Oh, so uh, basically, I just answered that question asked by Yijing. How much ratio recommended to take profit but still keep invested? So uh, yes, it's the same. Similar questions as Yijing. So basically, if the company still makes money, still is growing, you don't want to sell off the company just because it has already given you just 30, 40, 50 percent of gain. If the company can continue to grow, let the company grow. Or else, I think if you are invested in the market for quite some time, you will be the one selling the company at two ringgit and then the company continues to grow. Uh, share price goes up to three ringgit and you'll be the one saying that oh my god, why, why did I sell the company off when it was 2 ringgit and now it's up by 3 ringgit already. So um, do not look at the price too much. Just keep on focusing on how the company is performing and that would eventually dictate how high the company will go in terms of its share price. Okay, next, Yi Jing. Yi Jing is saying, does the suspension of IDSS actually affect or this fake bull run? Mm, possibly. I think this is a very good uh, suggestion, possibly because at current stage, Busan Malaysia actually suspends the uh, intraday short selling mechanism. So people cannot short the market. 
uh, so typically you have more buyers than uh, those short sellers to play with the uh, market prices. Next, City is asking, talking about cash is prints and RM has been depreciating big time. Do you think it is a good idea to convert our ringgit into other currencies? City, um, personally, I would say that uh, being a Malaysian, uh, we are still living in Malaysia. Uh, our daily expenditures, be it rent, be it um, entertainment, be it buying groceries, is still denoted in ringgit. Uh, of course, ringgit will still depreciate uh, or not. Uh, on the long term, it looks like it, but uh, it's still our home currency. And it's always a good idea to have a bit of home currencies uh, in the bank for your short-term usage. Uh, for cash that you don't really need, uh, you can convert it. But uh, like all other currencies, uh, if you just leave it in the safe, it will still depreciate uh, along the years. So the best way to really handle currencies or wealth in naturally is to uh, keep it invested into stocks or properties. Yeah, but, but I then... I think if you talk about currency, uh, maybe a lot of people ask, uh, we should go after USD. It has been going up and up and up. Uh, uh, based on the past experience, it has been the strongest uh, currency. But for me personally, if you want to do it this round, uh, you should really take a step back and look into the history of what is actually happening after 2008, where they have the crisis, they initiated quantum easing. And if you remember clearly, uh, your ringgit used to be go back to about 3, 3.3 back then. And I would assume the same thing, and now this round is unlimited QE, probably will have the same impact. But of course, long run, 10 years down the road, maybe go back up. Uh, I have no comment on it. But short term, if you, if you take a look in the history, you should be very cautious of it, especially if you go after USD. Jupan, maybe we can talk about the next. Okay. So Cyrus is asking, what method you guys use to calculate intrinsic value of a stock? Um, okay, basically, uh, we still use price to earnings ratio. Uh, we also use uh, dividend yield if you want to look into a dividend stock. Uh, but ultimately, the true intrinsic value is really the business model of the company. Let's say a company is so great that it virtually doesn't have any competitors, or even if the competitors come and challenge them, they also gulong tika. They also chop up. They also uh, cancel off their so-called plans. So these are types of company when they are so strong, people cannot challenge them, and then in the end they dictate uh, whatever they want to do. Uh, one very good example is currently you're on it is Facebook. Uh, back then, Google decided to come up with their own social media platform, Google Plus. Uh, didn't face very well against Facebook, and now Facebook has become the so-called de facto uh, advertisement platform. So whatever price they want to charge you to place advertisements on Facebook is up to them. If you don't think the price is fair, then so be it. They won't be uh, haggling the prices with you. So same goes to Instagram, which also owns by Facebook. So Facebook is the so-called mammoth when it comes to social media advertisement and they call the shots, not us. So this is why, or this is how we actually find an intrinsic value of a good company instead of just looking at the PE or the price. Okay, Cyrus also continued asking what are the good criteria in selecting a good company. Uh, in very basic terms, uh, we would always try to look at the four M's. This is a personal, um, personal acid, acid test, quick test that I ask myself every time I look at a company. Let's say if I look at a company, uh, does it fulfill the four M questions that I ask? First thing, the company must be having a good business mode with M for the first mode. And this means that the company must be very strong in what it's, it's doing. No competitors or no one can come and challenge them. And they are so strong, they set the rules, they set the price, and you have to pay the price. So the first M is mode. Secondly, I will look at the company's management, the second M. So every company is always governed or being uh, led by a person. So this person has to have the vision long-term vision to bring the company forward. And uh, this company, this person will also be in charge of handling the uh, management, the teams, his uh, subordinates inside the company. So that they stay harmony, they stay happy, they continue to contribute to the company. And once everything is okay, the company continues to grow. The third M I would look at is the margins. 
So when it comes to looking for uh, profitable companies, companies have to earn money and the more they earn, the better it is for shareholders. So I will look at the margins. I would also compare them against other companies to see that whether their margins are actually higher. So if a company can earn more than other company, same industry, of course, I would actually pick them because if I become a shareholder of a company, I also earn more because I'm a shareholder of a more profitable company. The last M would be, let me think, what was the last M? Margin. Uh, oh, yeah. Money. How the company actually handles money. So every day when the company uh, earns more and more, then they will eventually end up with more cash, more money on hand. So being the management, they, they must strategize on how to handle the money. Do they take the money and then they build more, grow the business bigger and bigger? Or they take a portion of it and give it back to shareholders as dividends. So some companies uh, or some management who are not far-sighted enough, they will simply misuse the money. And as shareholders, uh, eventually, uh, value will be destroyed because supposedly that money is uh, under your name, under a shareholder's name. And uh, if the management doesn't handle the money well, then uh, of course, that would be a question mark that we should avoid such this kind of company. Thoughts on Asia? Hmm. Okay, I will just keep it short. Uh, one day, if COVID-19 doesn't really uh, stop, uh, gets cured, uh, human mankind doesn't really uh, come over this COVID-19 crisis. No more vacation for us. Airplanes will never fly. And uh, they still need to continue to pay their salaries and whatsoever to their uh, employees. No one is getting sacked. As Patoni said, uh, they, just, they are just getting a pay cut. But they are still managing what they need to pay with the current cash they have on hand. So uh, long near term wise, really do not really uh, consider any stocks related to airlines or tourism. Thank you. We is giving an opinion. Uh, if you have an entry and exit, if you're based on FA, enter when the company's FA is good. Yep, you're right. And uh, exit if it's no good. And if you're based on TA, you should strictly follow your uptrend moving average and take loss if you have any uh, downtrend moving average. Okay, good. Thank you, Wee, for clarifying. Dylan, do you agree that the stock market is a future economy voting machine at this COVID-19 will eventually be cured in future, maybe a few months of years, hence how it's probably a good time to enter the market? Yep, I feel f fully agree with Dylan. We never know that uh, when is the actual day um, countries will actually announce that they come out with a cure for COVID-19. Of course, the market is currently at a downturn. Uh, I personally have stocks on hand. I'm staying invested uh, because I know that it could be just one lucky day. It could be tomorrow that um, news come out that they finally found a cure and the market just skyrockets. But if you are the one who is keep uh, being very bearish about it, uh, you think the worst haven't come yet uh, and you haven't bought anything yet, then of course, uh, you might want to take this opportunity to just buy a bit of a companies that you are safe to invest with because you'll never know when the bull run will come again or when COVID-19's cure will miraculously appear on the news headlines. Terry is not saying, uh, take Citibank uh, 08, 09, for example, if follow and buying strategy in for three batches, you will have bought in $400. $320 and $260 buy with every 20% gap. Oh, that's a very good um, methodology you're sharing. It will still go down and never recovered um, more than 100 ringgit until today. Is it a reliable business? Yes. Is it a big company? Yes. Is it still earning with growth? Yes. So with your exit strategies, what are the point and how do you realize your analysis is not working and cut loss? Terry, Mm, this is a very sound question. Uh, I like the way uh, I like this question very much because eventually, uh, yes, companies can continue to earn money, but share price do not reflect. Um, this is where we go deeper into how um, companies actually uh, play around with the outstanding shares because eventually, um, companies' earnings is eventually translated to earnings per share, and earnings per share you times the PE ratio will get the selling price. So sometimes companies uh, along the road, they will, have, um, they will have some actions on their shares. Maybe they want to do rights issue or they want to buy, do share buybacks. So 
every, along the way, along the day, or along at every uh, the years, um, companies' outstanding shares will increase or decrease. So eventually, that would have an impact on the outstanding shares and also the in earnings per shares. And uh, that is what happens if the company's management uh, feeders around with the outstanding shares too much and uh, your share price eventually don't go up, even though the company also continues to earn money. And for particularly banking stocks, uh, Citibank, it's an uh, international bank, but it has a lot of uh, key uh, competitors in the bank industry as well. So you have to take a look at other big banks and do a comparison to ensure that you are buying or investing at the uh, better banks. 4M, I like the idea. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Cyrus. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's a very basic asset test. You should ask yourself before you maybe spend more time to analyze a company. Let's see. Okay, I think time is, we still have a little bit of time. Let me wrap up this with a few other questions. Okay. Uh, what is a good money management plan for investing? Caleb is asking. Like percentage of funds go into emergency, percentage goes into downturn market watch, has percentage into equities. In color, it boils down to personal preferences, but uh, if for emergency, it's pretty much standard. Ensure you have roughly six months plus of emergency uh, for money that you need to use for the near term, be it your mortgage payment, your, your car loan payment, uh, your money that you need to buy groceries with. So ensure you have six months of it and never ever invest if you don't have that much of safety buffer, emergency buffer. Because if that happens, you will end up selling your shares to stay alive. Uh, percentage goes into the town market. So eventually, if you have saved up enough money for emergency, uh, now would be the time you uh, maybe have more cash on hand. And uh, you will be looking to allocate this money during this time. So how many percent really depends on how much you have saved up before the market actually crash. So personally, you have to, personally, I think a number of like 30% to 40% on hand would be a good number. And uh, this is where your, uh, this is where you actually make, take advantage of the bear market. Lah. Yijing is asking, uh, Do you think the current ratio is important? Is this, wow, well, it's a lot of question. In this COVID-19 situation, some of it is more than the site. Yep. Uh, RGB, okay. Wow, well, RGB focus is more. Uh, okay, uh, basically she's asking which I would I invest, RGB rate or sun rate. Um, I think both bits are good, uh, are good at, what they are doing. IGB is very strong in the retail market. Uh, also, uh, but they are looking to diversify their investment portfolios, properties into other sectors. Uh, both are very good reads. Uh, Sun Reed is very aggressive when it comes to growing and uh, uh, good. Uh, of course, they will be facing some short-term uh, liquidity squeeze, but I think once MCO is over, uh, they would be quite on track to catch on any po positive uh, consumer sentiments. Oh, it is becoming more and more stock-centric, uh, Chumbing. Yep. Yeah, Chumbing is... You there, Jumping? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I think yeah, there are a lot, a lot of stock uh, centric kind of question, which is we, we think maybe we will we'll take a pause now. Uh, if you guys really like uh, our sharings, uh, I hope we to do more session like this. Uh, we will be very happy to see uh, you leave your more of your comment uh, after this session. Then uh, we will do some poll or some 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 posts uh, to talk about all these uh, uh, based on you guys feedback uh, we'll try to cover as much as possible um, really thanks for all of you that stay with us uh, until the, the very end uh, we were surprised that until now we still have about 
29 to 30 kind of person still stay active. I think it's a very good number. Uh, we will be doing a, a wrap up right now. Uh, if you guys uh, first time go into our Facebook page, uh, it would be good if you can give us a like and, and share some of our content to, to your friends. Uh, and then of course, this is our official website where we share all of our thoughts or all of our uh, infographic about uh, the boring stock numbers uh, and graph. We try to turn into something uh, interesting. Uh, you can always check out uh, the articles that we put in this website. Lastly, uh, if you are more uh, Instagram person other than Facebook, uh, you can follow, follow our Instagram. Uh, we promise uh, beside all these uh, all this series uh, sharing about stock analysis, uh, investment related topic uh, on and off. We also like to be very uh, chips about it. Uh, we try to make memes, uh, make joke about people, but we, of course, we won't touch about politics and so on. It can, it can be very sensitive. Uh, we will be doing a lot of sharing, which is more of uh, uh, the joke around investment, but we hope the joke behind it always comes with some message. That, that you can catch the meaning uh, that we try to deliver. Uh, it's always good that uh, investment, investing is a long, long run. Uh, it's, a, it's a marathon. It's, it's not like something that you learn today. You work very hard, nonstop, uh, reading a, a, a lot of stock, uh, annual reports, then, then you can get a lot of results uh, the day after. No, it's, it's a long run. You need to learn from it. Maybe you need to pay a, a huge price of it. Uh, losing huge sum of money on your first few stock is very normal. But as long as you are determined on it, uh, work hard, and then uh, always share with a lot of different different peoples, exchange opinion, keep up with the news. I think one day we will be able to be financially free. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, for those questions that we didn't manage to answer through live, we will definitely answer it uh, through the comment section. So do keep in touch. We will be replying to all your questions. We are not leaving you behind. Uh, okay, definitely. Uh, so stay yeah. in touch for our second video. Ben, is it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely plan on it. But, but I, I, I received one interesting uh, comment.